Thank you so much, Chris, and uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our next session here on Discovering How to Make Your Impact, where we're going to be talking about how the growing field of impact investing can help nonprofits uh, achieve their mission and the implications for risk and return in the portfolio. Um, my name is George Dyer. I'm the Executive Director of the Intentional Endowments Network, uh, and IEN is a nonprofit peer learning network. So we support endowments and foundations and their service providers in advancing uh, these conversations around effective mission-aligned investing strategies um, that you know we believe can really have the power to shift our economic system to be more equitable, just, and sustainable, and, and help um, these organizations fulfill their mission. So I'm joined by three fantastic panelists today. Um, Beth Sorrell, who is president and CEO of the Jewish Community Foundation of San Diego. Suzanne Breggi, who is head of impact investing at Finio. And Amy Ridge, who's a partner with Mercer Alternatives. And in just a minute, I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves and their work. Um, but first, just a little bit about what we're seeing uh, in this space within our network. Um, so IEN, we have about 210 members, and they include higher education endowments, some foundations and faith-based groups, other nonprofits, uh, as well as investment consultants, outsourced CIOs, and managers across asset classes. And uh, within the network, you know, we really explore the, a broad range of impact themes, um, but much of our work and much of the conversations um, with our members is focused on climate risk and climate solutions, as well as issues of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, or JEDI in the investment process. And on climate, um, as was mentioned a bit earlier, we're spending a lot of time with our members on the concept of net zero portfolios. So, so those that engage with all companies and assets in the portfolio to ensure that they are reducing emissions uh, at a pace that's in line with the Paris Agreement and a 1.5 degree Celsius uh, global warming target. And this is, you know, in some ways different from fossil fuel divestment, which has been a big part of the conversation over the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, but it can also include full or, or partial divestment. And uh, I found it really interesting to, to hear, see that stat from the Mercer survey of 37% of respondents um, planning or having made a net zero commitment already. Uh, in terms of JEDI, a lot of our members are focused on increasing allocations to underrepresented managers, uh, having a lot of conversations about what that looks like and, and even setting targets to... Um, you know, allocate a certain percentage of the portfolio to um, women and people of color in leadership at, at their managers, um, as well as looking at their own JEDI practices internally. So board and investment staff make up, um, as well as looking at how to engage uh, and evaluate companies uh, on these topics to improve corporate practice. So in all these areas, um, you know, we think there are opportunities across asset classes to to drive change and have meaningful impact, as well as um, you know, protect capital and, and enhance returns. So uh, we're gonna hear from our panelists on how they're seeing this play out with nonprofits in the market. Um, and Beth, uh, I'd like to start with you if we could, and just ask you to tell us a little bit about your foundation's journey to date and how it got started and maybe what some of the biggest barriers were and, and what some of the most helpful tools were in making progress. Sure, thanks so much. So the Jewish Community Foundation in San Diego is a community foundation. So we manage philanthropy, philanthropy for about a thousand uh, individuals and families, as well as for a number of um, nonprofit organizations. So there are just a, a huge number of stakeholders with a diverse set of impact interests and risk tolerances and so forth and so on. Um, we, we introduced an impact investment pool um, which invests across all asset classes about five years ago. Um, it, it is performing uh, absolutely consistent with the market. So we're seeing more and more interest as our track record grows. Um, the real uh, barrier or process, it's all about education. So, you know, we have an investment committee like the previous panels we're talking about with a diverse set of interests and you know, fears around ESG and impact. And we've just had to constantly take baby steps and educate at every step of the way. Um, you know, and then the longer you have a track record, uh, both in impact and in ESG, you know, then it gets easier because, you know, you can point to something that says, you know, we did it. Um, we did go with uh, introducing an impact investment pool actually before we, um, integrated ESG into some of our other um, pool options. Uh, you know, we have a long-term, a short-term, a mid-term, an endowment pool, et cetera, and an impact investment pool. 
And I think the reason for that was just that there was this feeling that if it was segregated, it felt less risky because then it was only impacting donors that chose to go into it. And so it met the niche need of some of our uh, clients. Um, but as it's done better, we've then introduced an ESG integration into our long-term pool. Um, and more and more, we see when we survey our donors, when we talk to our donors, um, that they really want some ESG um, you know, integration in, in their portfolios within this philanthropic context. Um, but I would say um, most useful tool is clear um, communication, real tra transparency about what you're doing, um, and real clear communication about what others are doing, what we're seeing in the marketplace. It's, it's all about education. And certainly, you know, I have people on my investment committee who are very skeptical of this. And it's just one step at a time and sort of knowing you know, when to push harder and, you know, when to say an incremental gain is a good for, you know, is a good step. Um, you know, I think if you're managing a private foundation, if you're looking at a private foundation or, you know, a, an educational endowment or whatever, you don't have quite as many stakeholders that are active in the process. Um, and so we've really had to herd cats in a, in a certain way. Um, but even with smaller, you know, you're going to have skeptics and the education. We brought in some speakers, some, you know, we had Mercer, our, our Mercer advisor, come speak and share the experience at a broader level. And we've just taken, ba it's baby step education, baby step education, baby step education. And I would say it has been like three steps forward to one step back. So progress, you know faster than some would like, but not as fast as others might like. That's great. Thank you, Beth. And yeah, we see that all the time in the network, the importance of education. And I think some really practical suggestions there in terms of, you know, working with your consultants and also bringing in external folks. You know, we do a lot of sort of peer-to-peer -peer networking and bringing in folks from other boards that have been through this to, to speak to your board or investment committee, which we find can be helpful. Um, so Suzanne, uh, all right. If we could turn to you to have you tell us a little bit about your work with Finio and, and maybe how things might uh, look a little differently um, in continental Europe with regard to impact investing. Thank you so much, George, and thanks, Beth, for, for sharing. <clears throat> Happy to talk about what we do. Finio is a philanthropic advisor and an impact investing advisor, and we also offer next to the advisory services, we also offer measurement services, impact measurement services which differ a little bit depending on whether the client is um, a foundation, a donor versus an asset manager or commercial financial investor. But the DNA is very, very similar. Um, this is what we do as an organization. We are 70 persons for the time being mainly active in German speaking areas. This is why I know quite a bit about uh, what's going on in German speaking areas. I personally have a traditional background. I have worked for traditional private equity and hedge funds before I started to exclusively focus on impact investing over 10 years ago. I, in the, over the past years, I, I lived in London for a, year, for a long time, but also in New York, um, where I also had the chance to get impressions from what's happening in, in your areas, in your geographies. Um, so, Comparing those continents are, are pretty interesting. I do believe also, if I, if I relate to what you are saying, Beth, for us, um, I, I'm convinced that, especially continental Europe, is more welcoming and supporting the notion of responsible investing, sustainability, and impact investing. I think this has started longer ago, this interest. Um, and I believe it started even in the Scandies, so more in the north of Europe before it took over and also included Germany, France, Switzerland. Um, but, and I will elaborate a little bit more on that later, how we interpret impact. And we don't advise when it comes to ESG in liquid markets, when we talk about impact and impact investing, we talk about private markets because for us, what counts is um, real world impact. And this is mainly happening in private markets and less 
in liquid markets, especially on the second level market, but I can um, yeah, go into more details on this later. And this is something where the Anglo-Saxons are further ahead than continental Europe. It's much more in your DNA, and when I say you, I think of UK, and I especially think of US, than for continental Europe's uh, European investors or foundations. We, for instance, don't have the notion of an endowment where you know you have big money being put in endowments and investment investment professionals sitting on it and managing this. Think about Yale endowment, Harvard endowment, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We don't have that. Um, and it's just now that we see where, uh, for I mean, our situation is a little bit different than yours, Beth, because someone becomes a client of ours if they want philanthropic advice or impact investing advice. But what I can absolutely relate to, what you were just saying is, of course, we also have to go about and, 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 and try to get clients. So we are having lots and lots of conversations around this as well. But once we are working with a client, they want to make impact investing or they want to give, they want to become a donor. Um, and it's also interesting what we see there on the impact investing side, and this is now really true for the German speaking area. All of our null clients are next gens. They are inheriting money. They are inheriting a lot of money. They clearly say, I don't have to make more money. Of course, I want to protect it. Of course, I want to have a financial return. But the wealth is already there. So what can I do differently? And also, I do believe the sense of thankfulness and being humble, maybe, because they have inherited also makes them to think more about empowering others through investments. So we are getting more and more clients who are in this transitioning process of getting money, of inheriting money, but wanting to think differently. And all of them have family offices, but they don't really trust them because they were hired by the parents and they did it traditionally. So they want to see someone who's really committed to impact investing and gets them. This is, for instance, why we have in our team also talking about peer-to-peer, -peer, what you were just mentioning, George, we have someone who is a next-gen and an heir in our team, and he can talk to those on a really high level. I started this process seven years ago, where you are maybe today, and I think those, those practical examples, how did you do it? What was your learning curve? What money did you maybe pay for that learning curve is enormously important. So peer-to-peer -peer for us is super important. And then on the endowment, and the, sorry, not endowment, but foundation side, we also are gaining traction among them. Um, Yes, because we know the foundation world in German speaking areas really well. And if we go to them and say, look, and we are a charity ourselves, by the way, we can help you to do it. Trust us. They are now starting to open up. But believe me, it was a tough walk. And it's still only a few who are starting to open up. So, yeah. And I think there you are more advanced. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, there's definitely a lot of on-ramps onto this, and it's fascinating how different stakeholder groups can drive it, but um, oftentimes come to, to similar places. So, Amy, we'd love to hear how Mercer is helping clients through this journey, and uh, maybe you could specifically tell us about your work uh, around diversity, equity, and inclusion in, in these conversations. Sure. I feel like I kind of sit in between Beth and Susan, um, you know, helping to helping clients wherever they are on their journey is really what we do. And so, to best point, sometimes that is, let's talk to boards, let's put surveys out to see, to assess how important different aspects of impact is. Is DEI a focus? Is ESG, is environmental more of a focus? Just trying to assess, or is none of that a focus and we and we keep moving forward with the road that we're on? Um, I also solely focus on private markets and I lead our DEI research here at Mercer. And so I spend a lot of time, um, I work with a lot of our endowment foundation clients and just trying to understand 
how they want to integrate impact into their portfolio. And when it comes, especially to, to DEI and investing and historically underinvested people, it's what, assessing what does your portfolio look like today? You don't know what your starting point is if you don't know that. Um, how do you define diverse or how do you define impact? Mm -hmm. Those are all things that we work on. Um, diversity, some people think is at an ownership level. Some others also look at key decision makers. So just helping think through what, how do we define it? And then what is our portfolio at today? And then, you know, Chris was saying earlier, some great policy things to think about. Are we establishing, um, you know, certain percentage targets? I want my portfolio to be 30% impact by 2025. I want diversity to be 50% of my private markets managers by 2030, whatever it is. Let's write that, you know, is it a policy? Is it a percentage or is it just let's ensure that we are looking at more impact, more diverse managers, those types of things. Um, so I really help with that. And then I'm also the person out there in the market doing calls with managers, shaking hands, meeting people, understanding what the best opportunities are in the market, because, you know, it's our fiduciary duty, as we said, um, this is not make, make impact investments, make DEI investments um, for, you know, for a charity reason, but it's really a returns first approach. Yes. And that's what we have to do. But in order to do that, there are hundreds of managers in the private markets today that can meet these mandates, can add this to your portfolio, but they're all at different, you know, different levels, different institutionalization levels. And so um, that's that's really what we do is we help to curate calendars. We help to provide solutions to clients, again, where meet them wherever they are in their journey of impact and DEI. Yeah, so I can echo that so much. I, I do believe, and we also believe that the financial return side has to work as well, because otherwise it's never going to be mainstream. And our vision is very clearly we want impact investments in every portfolio and also in every portfolio of fiduciary managers who could not, because of their fiduciary duty, invest in lower returning um, mm -hmm. strategies and, and, and products. Um, and it's doable. Um, and over the course of the last 10 years, I've had so many managers, what you just described as meeting, talking, shaking hands. And I'm absolutely convinced that it's doable, but it's, it's, you have to do your homework. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 And I would agree. I mean, in our network, and this comes back to the definitions in some ways too. Um, mm -hmm. but I think, you know, uh, there are some who will say, you know, impact investing must be concessionary returns, but in our network, we have a lot of higher education endowments and really think about impact in that sort of returns first perspective. Um, and do think that there are great opportunities kind of across that whole spectrum from pure philanthropy to, you know, high return, high performing impact investments. Um, and on this kind of note of terminology, um, Beth and Suzanne, you both kind of talked a bit about the dis uh, differentiation between ESG and impact and how that shows up in different asset classes. Um, and yeah, I was wondering if we could talk a little bit more about that, Beth, and how, you know, you've been taking kind of a whole portfolio approach to that and how you distinguish them. Sure. Um, so I think it's really important to note that every investment is an impact investment in the sense that every investment has impact. And it's really a question of what is that impact? To what extent are you paying attention to that impact? And is it impact that you want to have or you don't want to have? Um, and I think if we're really honest, we have to admit that even the investments that have the most positive impact that are totally mission aligned, they also you know, have some impacts that maybe we're not so crazy about. You know, there's, there's no such thing as the perfect investment, be it an impact investment or any other kind of investment. Um, we think about impact uh, investing as having direct positive impact in an area that we're, you know, that's aligned with our mission. And so that tends to take place in the private market. You are more directly investing in a, in a fund that's invest, investing in companies that are doing very specific, measurable, impactful things while they're making money. And I want to be clear, everything that we do um, is uh, you know, has a fiduciary duty, is competitive market rate returns, et cetera. Um, 
we think about ESG in the public markets where you can, you know, more integrate the processes. It is harder to measure impact in the public markets because it's much more diffuse and further sort of down a value chain, if you will. Um, and it's not directly attributable to your investment. And so we look at the processes that managers are using in terms of, how, you know, what are the due diligence processes um, in terms of how managers are selecting um, their investments and, and what they're looking at in, in how they're assessing public companies in terms of their environmental and, and social and governments, governance activities, the processes and activities that they do. But, but measuring the actual outcomes and direct impacts is very difficult. That said, in the public markets, their shareholder engagement. And um, we are generally uh, opposed to screening out anybody. Um, or anything. We are much more interested in being an active owner in the public market. So we are, you know, through partnerships, very engaged shareholders um, on environmental issues, on social issues, um, and on issues that are obviously particularly relevant to the Jewish community, religious tolerance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so we think about it in, in both ways. So wh whatever asset class you're in, you know, there are ways to be impactful um, and you have to, and, and while you are earning a market rate of return. And so you have to look within each asset class at the best way to be impactful. Um, and I think in the public markets, it's really a shareholder engagement uh, strategy, you know, in terms of proxies and, uh, you know, actively approaching companies about their behavior and changing that behavior. And we have seen globally some really impressive successes in the last few years around shareholder engagement. Um, and then in the private markets, it's there's much more of an ability to target a geography or a, a, a UN sustainability goal and and really have very targeted impact. And yeah. in the interest of time, I'll stop there. Yeah, no, that's great. I'm glad I mean, you mentioned the public markets and, and engagement as a way to have impact because there's really great scale there but as you said it's you know kind of a different approach and you know Suzanne you mentioned this that you really focus on the private markets and the direct impact there and I'm yeah I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about how that shows up and maybe the concept of scale how that scales also to have broad impact. Mm. Don't forget I have a different starting point than Beth. Um, we are focused on private markets um, we do the measurement in both. We do the measurement, the impact measurement on the liquid side and on the illiquid side. But because we see exactly the difference that Beth was referring to, we talk on the liquid side about impact alignment and on the private side about impact as in real world impact. But we have tools for both. But when it comes to advising, we are focused on private markets because we don't have to manage um, differently to Beth money overall asset classes. We are a specific addendum to wealth that wants to have that exposure in private markets and impact investing. And of course, all of our clients have millions and millions and millions in liquid strategies. This is also not judgmental that we make this difference between alignment and real world impact. It's just the DNA of the asset class. And of course, every professional portfolio should have everything, fixed income, uh, stocks, hedge funds, private market investments, it's that it is. I do absolutely agree with Beth that we have seen some interesting things going on, on the even on the secondary market through engagement strategies, just recently hearing about Carl Icahn's stance to speak up for animal welfare and, you know, buying stocks from McDonald's so he can speak up for animal welfare is amazing. But we also see lots and lots of engagement strategies dealing with governments, which is also, which when it comes, for instance, to disclosure, it might be investor in, in, interesting for the investor who buys the stock, but it's not going to change anything out there in the real world. And very often, even ESG without engagement thing is divesting. And if I sell a stock, someone else is going to buy it. But here again, it's just the DNA of the asset class. And I agree with Beth. One should really look at how can I have positive impact within an asset class and go as far as possible. Mm -hmm. The element that I like about private markets 
so much. And I also think why this is more active is influence. I mean, I have to buy a lot of Siemens or Allianz shares before Joe Kaiser or Oliver Beater is picking up his phone when I ring. This is never going to happen. <laughs> but I am, I am invested on behalf of a client of mine in an in a Indian startup, healthcare startup, um, private eye care for the poor. I'm on WhatsApp with the founder. I, I, I talk to him once a week, although we are a tiny, tiny investor. And this is what I like, being an active investor, talking about strategy, talking about linking, impact and profitability, talking about what is happening when you have unintended consequences. You were referring to impacts that you might not want to have, but they might happen. And having this like-mindedness. And this is, it's not just, I think, how we're going to change a lot of things, fundamental problems, but it's also a lot of fun. This is why I'm just a big fan of private markets, whether it's, okay, that was a venture capital example, but also private equity. And I think this is also how you can see scalability happen there. Of course, the lever, if you change things, if I can really um, uh, manage this to change McDonald's element, animal welfare policies, the scalability is huge. But think of innovation. Think of what can start small and become massive. And I think innovation is happening also a lot through private markets. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's great. And so, Amy, I'd like to come back to you. And, you know, you mentioned DEI in your process, and that's a, a big focus area for our members as well. And I'm just wondering if you have, you know, thoughts on the best approaches or specific resources that the audience might benefit from uh, in approaching this and, and how you think about sort of the S and ESG as it relates to the E and the G. Yeah, I know a lot of people say DEI is the S, but I also think it's the G, right? It's governance models. It's looking at how you're putting together your, your investment committees, your founders, all of that. So um, for me, you know, we had to define what diversity meant to us. We look at both ownership and key decision makers. Uh, we look at investment committee composition. We look at the portfolio managers leading a fund, as well as looking at ownership. Because I think if we don't, I like the broader definition. It's harder to measure. Um, so a lot of people go with that ownership piece. We went one step further with the key decision maker piece, because if we're not helping people change who gets a seat at the table today, we're not allowing professionals to build resumes and track records to then hang their own shingle one day. And so that's how we look at it. We also wanted it to be the largest um, investment pool possible to choose from. Um, and and D, the diverse manager space is large and it is growing monthly. I can attest by the amount of emails I get with new fund introductions. But um, I would say, you know, definitely the, the ILPA website, Institutional Limited Partners Association is a great website. They have about four different, they have a ESG roadmap, they have a DEI roadmap, they have a DEI data collection template that is being used by a lot of institutional investors today, which means that GPs are actually willing to fill it out for you. So you can really assess the, the diversity at all levels of an organization. Um, they have helpful tips. So I think that that's a really great website um, to use as a resource. I also really like the NAIC website. That is the largest, it's for, for US investments, but it's the largest diverse network um, in the U.S., and it has about 150 managers on there that you can meet with. So it's a great sourcing mechanism if you want to take a look at some some really top-notch managers. Um, so I definitely say those resources have helped us in our journey as well. Yeah, that's great. And those are, yeah, definitely both great groups doing work in this area. Um, and that reminds me, I just mentioned, we have a, a racial equity investing primer for endowments also um, that's freely available on our website. That is, I think, a good roadmap and references some of those other groups. Um, we're going to shift and spend uh, the, the remainder of our time with um, some audience questions. We've got some good ones coming through, but for others, please send them through and we'll get to as many as we can in the, the last few minutes here. Um, but the first one is if uh, our panelists are seeing any investors using the UN Sustainable Development Goals as a framework um, or as target setting in their impact investing journeys. Pretty um, much everyone, I would say. Interesting. So in, at the large, you know, I think it, it, in the family office world, I think that is happening. 
you know, at the large sort of more institutional, um, I'm trying to drive us in that direction, um, but we're not, and, and none of my community foundation, um, I mean, I still have people here in the United States where I say UN SDG and they go, what? Oh, and wow. so we, oh yeah, Suzanne, you know, and even, um, yeah, I, I, that even people who you would think would know better, um, don't. And so, yeah. and, and of course in, in our world, in the community foundation world, you know, we've been tracking our grants forever through a, you know, a certain classification system, which is not great. And, um, but migrating it to the UN SDGs and figuring out how to deal with when, you know, cause you do it a pie, right? You want it to add up to a hundred. And when you, you, when you look at how either grants or investments map against the SDGs, many, it's many to many. And, um, and so we just haven't figured out how, what to do with all our historical data. And I just have, I don't have the resources right now to sort of make that switch. I talk about it a lot, but um, we're not really using them. Um, yeah, that's a we see too. We use it sort of as a framework for education about the, the broad range of issues, but less as sort of an implementation tool. But I know, yeah, I know that yeah. conversation is very different in Europe. Um, we've got a lot of great questions. I want to get to as many as we can. And I think this is a really good one is what has been an easy starting point, if there is such thing as an easy starting point to kind of get the conversation going on this. I mean, I think we've heard lots of examples about there's lots of different on ramps into this work. Um, and so, you know, I don't know, Amy, maybe if you have thoughts on how you've seen clients kind of approach this or, or Beth, if you have recommendations on what might be an easy starting point. Um, well, for the foundation, um, for the foundation world, Mission Investors Exchange um, has a ton of resources. Um, you know, you have to start by educating yourself. So like you're on this webinar, but, you know, this is 40 minutes. Um, and so it's really look at the Global Impact Investing Network, look at Mission Investors Exchange and start talking to people, set up conversations one on one. I, most people, pretty much everyone I know in the impact investing space wants to convert, you know, wants to help other people come up behind them. And, you know, I talk to people across the United States all the time who are trying to do their first, take their first step. And, and you just, you know, you just have to talk to people and, and educate yourself and then start educating others. And these resources that everybody's been mentioning um, are there for you. That's great. Amy, other thoughts? Yeah, I, I would agree. I think education and I think I think once you actually start looking, you know, what where do you want to go? Do you want it to be in your private markets piece, in your public markets piece, you know, kind of getting a high level, okay, where at least are we starting? And as you heard on the call today, a lot of us think that private markets is an easier way. It's more intentional in what you put your money in. It can be more impactful to Stan's point. Um, but then it's it's not as scary once you start. So I would say start talking to people. I I would love to tell you about our top ideas in ESG and DEI for you to look at. I'm sure Beth would love to talk to you through how she, like just reaching out and, and starting and then just jump in. It's not as scary as you think it is, I promise. Yeah, those are, <laughs> and those are great specific resources, Beth. I mean, I think, you know, Mission Investor Exchange, you mentioned the Global Impact Investing Network. Confluence Philanthropy is another one for foundations. That's a great set of resources. Um, and at the Intentional Endowments Network, we have a roadmap that's really just designed for this. It's sort of just a graphical framework to bring to your board that says, you know, start with learning and education and work through this process. Um, and I think, you know, it is a process. So taking that first step is sometimes the hardest, but uh, most important. Um, I'm going to try and squeeze one quick. Actually, no, I think we don't have enough time. Unfortunately, we've got some great questions, but uh, we're just a couple minutes to wrap up. Um, and so I think we'll have to leave it there, but I do want to just uh, ask each of our panelists to maybe provide 30 seconds on, um, you know, if there's one key takeaway action item uh, or lesson learned that you might want to leave our audience with, what would that be? Um, and if you could do so in 30 seconds or less, that would be great. And uh, Beth, I'll, we'll start with you again. Um, I mean, I feel like I've said the whole education thing a thousand times, but um, I guess I'm learning, um, you know, you're not going to convince everybody and you just have to move forward with the people who 
are interested in and take small steps and each step will you know will prove a a point and then you have a, a track record to build on and um be patient mm -hmm. yeah that's great and suzanne i would probably say do your homework um don't get too impressed by pity pretty pictures or great ideas, it's still investing. And although I'm echoing Amy, it's not as scary as it is, but I see a lot of people who mean well, but who cannot really do well. Um, mm. Don't get carried away with a great idea, it's still investing. And maybe coming back to education, you need to get the investment know-how or organizations with the investment know-how nevertheless. That's a great point, especially as the market matures and becomes more mainstream. There's a lot of options out there and you've got to be careful. And more juice. washing as well, impact yeah. washing too. I see a lot of that happening yeah. right now. That was not the case 10 years ago. Now, too many. And that worries me. That, that's yeah. a yes. worry. Yes. All right, and Amy, final thoughts? Um, I would just say, you know, it's easy to wait. It's easy to wait for someone else to make the first move. Wait to see who else is doing it. Um, just don't wait. Wherever you're at, start the process, whether it's education, implementation, yeah. um, you know, the best things in life can be scary at first, but it's, it's really not that scary. The numbers are in your favor. We have lots of investment opportunities today. We have lots of returns first investment opportunities today. Um, so I would just say, you know, dip your toe in the water and you'll find yourself swimming in no time. Super. I absolutely agree, Amy. Yeah, great place to leave it, to, to take action and get moving. Uh, and I know any of us would be happy to connect and some of these other groups we've mentioned, so do so reach out. Um, so with that, uh, on behalf of the, the Mercer team and, and all the participants in today's event, uh, thank you so much for joining us today for Not For Profits in Focus, today's insights and tomorrow's strategies. Um, it's been a, a pleasure and thank you so much to all of our speakers in this session and the previous ones. Um, they've all been very insightful and I know the Mercer team looks forward to sharing the full uh, global not-for-profit report with you all soon. So with that, have a great day and thank you very much.